Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 3, When Green Energy Ain't So Green, with guests Laura Cunningham and Kevin Emmerich of Basin and Range Watch. Basin and Range Watch is a nonprofit group working to conserve the deserts of Nevada and California and to educate the public about the diversity of life, cultures, and history of the desert, as well as sustainable, local, renewable energy alternatives. They seek to protect desert wildlands and species, groundwater resources, dark night skies, culturally important landscapes, local ways of life, and much more. A major focus of theirs is the current push by federal and state agencies to open up undisturbed habitat and public lands in the desert to energy development. They say, quote, Our goal is to identify the problems of energy sprawl and find solutions that will preserve our natural ecosystems and open spaces. We specialize in ground truthing proposed project sites and reporting our findings to the public so that everyone is well informed about how to comment during agency review periods. We pioneered citizen science monitoring of energy projects in the desert. We support energy efficiency, better rooftop solar policy, and distributed generation storage alternatives, as well as planning for wise energy and land use following the principles of science and conservation biology." End quote. Laura Cunningham has a bachelor's degree in paleontology from the University of California at Berkeley, where she also studied zoology, botany, herpetology, and natural resource management. Additionally, she undertook graduate study at the University of California, Santa Cruz, in science communication. She is also a talented artist, who has published two illustrated books, A State of Change, Forgotten Landscapes of California, and a children's book, The Bay Area Through Time. Kevin Emmerich is a former National Park Ranger and field biologist. He has focused on desert conservation and land issues for many years. The three of us spoke on the phone on March 8, 2020. We talked about the many issues with large-scale green energy projects in the deserts of the Southwest, and also about common-sense, locally-based alternatives. This is the second time I interviewed them together. A transcript of the first one in 2015 appears in my book, Road Tripping at the End of the World, available at my website. Their message, that green energy ain't always green, deserves far, far more attention than it gets. Hello, Laura. Kevin, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? Cool. So I wanted to start today with the very basics of what you're concerned with and what you do, and then we'll get more. We'll, we'll talk more about specific projects later. The point I want to start with is that most people are unaware that green energy, quote, renewable energy, has its own ecological costs that can be quite significant and quite serious. It seems like most people think, oh, we'll just put up solar panels and wind wind uh, farms and then we're, we're fine, no harm, we can just move on. But as I know from talking to you all and on a number of occasions and doing my reading, this is certainly not true. So maybe you could just start there for us today. Well, I can start and I can just say, um, you know, we've been looking at different types of energy for over 10 years now. And when we get into the renewable energy, um, if it's not planned in a way that um, concern that has concerns for the environment, um, there really are no energy free lunches. Um, in fact, large scale renewable energy by nature is, is not a concentrated producer of energy. So it requires 
a massive land footprint. So while fossil fuel can have um, negative impacts as far as emitting emissions, um, um, being bad for climate change, renewable energy can equally have bad environmental impacts by just altering and completely uh, changing landscapes, and in our opinion, for the worse. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, there's a lot of, um, this has been happening for 10 years now where solar developers have been targeting our public lands and intact, healthy desert ecosystems to build these sometimes huge projects. I mean, we're dealing with one now that's 7,200 acres, and that's 11 square miles. That's the size of the city of Berkeley. And it's beautiful creosote desert with choya cactus and some Mojave yucca. And it's going to be bladed and graded. And then the mitigation for the federally threatened desert tortoise will be they'll mow the creosote down to 18 inches. And so after 10 years of us at Basin Range Watch trying to say, you know, we really need to put these on rooftops and parking lot shade structures and on warehouses and and really empty lots in the city. We're still dealing with beautiful Mojave Desert landscapes are going to be destroyed for utility scale solar. Could you get into the details a little bit about exactly what that looks like? For example, I know that you all went out and documented what was going to have what was happening at the Ivanpah solar setup before that that happened. You took a lot of pictures the previous year and maybe that was fairly typical. So could you tell us kind of a step by step of what what it looks like when they come in for a, a solar project? Okay, well, first of all, what they have to do is, um, in order to mitigate the damage, um, they have to satisfy all of the needs that the Endangered Species Act, um, uh, or National Historic Preservation Act requires. So they send in people to survey and clear for tortoises. So it'll start out where they'll start constructing little fences that, contain the wildlife and keep the tortoises out and you'll start seeing people wandering around and driving around the habitat um, after they secure all that and they uh, so i would say they clear out all of the desert tortoises on the site they can't do that by the way it's really hard to find the juveniles but they'll give it their best shot but after they do that that's when the large heavy equipment comes in and then they start removing everything um, in the case of Gemini Solar, um, about 2,500 acres will just be completely obliterated. They'll take bulldozers and they'll, they'll do what they call disc and roll, and they'll completely scrape the habitat up. On an additional 4,600 acres, as Laura mentioned, they will mow the vegetation. And at that stage, it's not going to look too much different because they're going to go out there. They're going to run over everything. They're going to shred the vegetation down to the roots, essentially, and the entire area will be cleared. Um, once they do that, that's when they start building the solar panels. Um, on the area that they're going to traditionally destroy on 2,500 acres, the panels would be about um, 10, 8 to 10 feet off of the ground. Um, they'll, from a distance, look kind of like a large bluish lake. Um, from up close, they'll just completely block the view of the desert. Um, on the area that's mowed, the panels will be about 15 feet off the ground. Um, from a large perspective, they'll probably be more visible from a distance to create a huge blob. From a close-up perspective, um, the average motorist driving by won't even be able to see beyond them. So that'll give you a, a good idea. And Laura's got some additional. Yeah, and so when Kevin says clear the tortoises, that's actually a very specific protocol because the Mojave Desert tortoise is federally threatened. So you can't just go crush them. You have to um, try to move them. And I used to do this back in around 2004, 2005. And it was actually kind of a, a life-changing experience to work on a large development project in the desert 
where you're a so-called biologist, but what you really are is a mitigation specialist. And it, it was actually the seeds of me thinking we better form something like Basin or Range Watch to try to stop this. But you have a hundreds of people, biological monitors, they're called, and you walk in a line across the desert with creosote and um, just beautiful, intact public land. Lands, deserts, it can be private land in the case I was working on, with shovels, and everyone has a shovel in their hand. And you spend 10 to 12 hours a day crisscrossing in a GPS tracked grid. So you make sure you cover everything. And every single burrow you come across, you dig up all the way down, even if it's six feet down, and you, you try to find every tortoise. And if you find a tortoise, you carefully put it in a box and, and you measure it, make sure it doesn't have disease, maybe put a radio tag on it, and then you translocate it to a different area, and you put up a tortoise exclusion fence around this giant project. But you're also displacing rattlesnakes, burrowing owls, kit foxes, tarantulas, lizards, all these other animals that use these tortoise burrows. I mean, the tortoises dig the burrows, and then these other animals use them. But Largely, those animals are not, don't have any mitigation. They just have to go run away and fend for themselves, try to find another home, leave before they get crushed by the heavy, heavy machinery. And many will get crushed. Millions will get crushed. Millions will be killed. So that's what's still going on now after 10 years. We're, we're just massacring all these desert, the fauna and flora out there for large scale solar. Yeah, the, I've seen the you you mentioned that the the panels collection of panels look like a lake from a distance, and I've certainly noticed that driving through the area where I've seen something in the distance, uh, especially from up on a high space, and been like, oh, is that a is that a lake? There there wasn't a lake on the map, and then getting closer, noticed that oh, actually no, that's 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 a solar farm, and. Well, the birds also mistake this too. Isn't this one of the things that's a problem with these setups for birds? Oh, definitely. And in fact, it's it's really a concern for us because um, the agencies and the, the industry have really kind of made it difficult to study this particular impact. I mean, here's what we do know. Um, they find a lot more dead birds on the sites of the solar project than they do off the site. And we know that because the Bureau of Land Management did a three-year survey um, comparing bird mortalities on the solar site to bird mortalities on undeveloped land. And they found about two to three more dead birds on the sites than they did on the undeveloped land. So that really tells you something's going on here. Um, the industry will say that you don't have enough evidence to prove that there's something called a lake effect. Um, so, you know, we come back to them and say, well, we need to study that. We need to study it for a few years. The problem is, is the Bureau of Land Management and the other permitting agencies um, tend to have an innocent until proven guilty attitude about this um, because there is no um good peer-reviewed information that quantifies this particular situation, um, they're going with the attitude that it really is not uh, a real situation. In fact, we've heard representatives of the solar industry like First Solar say um, it's not even real. It's just hypothetical. It's just something. Um, we don't really know what birds are seeing. Um, some scientists say they see polarized glare. Others um, believe that they're actually looking at the color of the panels. But the point is, more are dying. They're putting these up in areas that are completely dry. And we have to wonder, are these um, solar false lakes mimicking old Pleistocene lakes? Um, the Mojave Desert had birds flying over it for millennia. Um, they fly over dry areas. Um, I mean, all life is opportunist. You see what looks like water, you go down to it. And then, of course, we get collisions. Um, we also get the deceiving effects where, that result in dehydration and just um, 
birds dying from exposure. Again, we don't have a lot of information on this because the companies won't allow it. Um, consider this, the Genesis Solar Project near Blythe, California. When it was being built, the workers were encouraged to report m bird mortalities, and they would just find those incidentally, and they found quite a number of those. You can even read it in Rewire by Chris Clark. He did a whole article about this. Later, they would do focused bird surveys on that project in limited parts of the project, and the numbers of bird mortalities went way down. That tells us they're not even looking, and they're um, biasly making the science look like this is not a problem. Did you mean the Ivanpah project where the workers were told to report the dead birds? No, no, this is the Genesis Solar Project. Oh, I don't know this one. Yeah, it's a, there's, a, there's a lot of these out there, and this is all down in the Chukwawa Valley in uh, Riverside County. And so it would be about 20 miles west of Blythe. Most of the projects down there are photovoltaic, but this is one of the few concentrated thermal plants. But it has a whole bunch of horizontal parabolic trough mirrors and those, too, reflect the sky, and they actually look like a lake. So I was using that as an example, but all of them do have similar incidents. Ivanpah is a little bit different because it had the towers, which produce that the solar flux energy that actually kills the birds in midair. Right. So people, I think, most of the time are picturing the the huge arrays of of the solar panels all set up, but there are other projects too, like Ivanpah, where instead they have a collection of solar panels, which are, well, not, not solar panels, they're actually reflectors, right? Which are reflecting sunlight towards a central tower, which is then heating water to turn a turbine, I believe is how it works. Yeah, exactly. Those are the solar thermal projects, which have proven to be really expensive and inefficient. So they stopped building those five or six years ago, but they are still examples like Ivanpah. Um, and the, the harm in those is they have these giant mirrors. I mean, at Ivanpah, the mirrors are the size of a garage door and they reflect sunlight onto a tall tower, which has a central water tank. And the and energy of all this square miles of solar energy pointed at that one water tank flashes the water into superheated steam. And so the steam goes down in the pipes and into just like you said, a like a traditional um, steam turbine that makes electricity. But the problem with those are that this solar flux it's called is like a what it does is it's an intense type of heat energy it's not like heat but it's it's a moving solar energy per unit like a square foot and when a bird passes through this it actually disintegrates the feather tips and the feathers because of this energy transfer and so they don't burn they actually disintegrate and melt. And we've seen a peregrine falcon, or I think it was a prairie falcon in a an animal rehab unit that had passed through the Crescent Dune solar power tower up by Tonopah, Nevada. And it was horrible. I mean, this thing was still alive and it's all of the flight feathers were curled and melted. And they and it was like it had sort of a burn on it from this heat energy. And it would probably never fly again. And they were just trying to tend to it. But they had had other examples turned in by workers that died because of this very strange, it's like a form of solar radiation. It's like an extreme intense sunburn that can be lethal. So we have videos that apparently show horned larks flying through the solar flux at Crescent Dunes and vaporizing, although there's actually a technical term for it pyrolyzing they just go poof into a a white sort of vapor from this intense energy now it's kind of funny to us that the crescent dune solar power tower was so large 
that it was it overheated itself and so the pipes the metal pipes began to melt and the welds cracked open because of the intense heat of all the solar radiation on this and in that case it was molten salt that went up the tower and directly heated molten salt which was then stored in a giant molten salt tank and this was supposed to be a way we were going to store energy into the night from a solar plant you know and and it was a very expensive idea and it turned out it just didn't work and especially on that scale and so that project is shut off now for it's been shut off for months and months because of these um leaks and welds that are coming apart so there's some really gigantic projects out there that were um paid for by our tax dollars that are now sitting there and that one will probably turn into a department of energy experimental plant wow so in some cases large tracts of desert wildlife habitat was destroyed but the final final project doesn't even work Correct. Yeah, that one's just sitting there turned off now for how many months, Kevin? Like um, almost a year. Almost a year now. It's been off. Wow. No, total waste of public land. But at least, at least it's not killing birds in the solar flux. So then solar, that's the one that I think a lot of people see. Then, And then another one that uh, people see a lot is the big wind farms where they'll have dozens or even hundreds of the wind turbines. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of building those and the ecological effects that they have? Yeah, I, I've actually watched them construct a large wind project near the town of Mojave. And it actually, they had to reroute the Pacific Crest Trail through that Tehachapi Pass area. Um, and no one even seemed to notice that until it was over. But um, they go out and these this was like hundreds of giant steel towers that can be 400, 500 feet tall. I mean, they just keep making them bigger to get like one megawatt or more out of each tower. But they have to dig a huge cement foundation into the desert. I mean, like a deep pour, huge amounts of cement to anchor these steel towers. And as an aside, I've always wondered what the carbon emissions are from all the cement and steel. A lot of the steel, I think, was made in China, and that, that might change now. But So there's a lot of road building. We've seen masses of Joshua trees in the West Mojave be bulldozed down and put in piles um, just to make room for more wind turbines and access roads. New transmission lines have to be built, substations. So you're fragmenting these intact desert ecosystems with roads like hundreds of miles of roads for wind turbine projects and then when you build them they kill birds like golden eagles there's even worry about california condors because they're these projects are inching closer to the core areas of california condors but burrowing owls sparrow hawks i mean it's it's devastating yeah the tips of the the wind turbine blades spin um, pretty fast. They go about almost, in some cases, if they're the really large one, uh, close to 200 miles an hour. Um, it's physics. So you get to the base of the turbine and you look at it. They don't really look to the, to the amateur eye that they're spinning fast. But once you get to the tips of those turbines they're moving so fast that they're just a blur and there's a variety of birds that just don't see them there's also bats um, there's something called barotrauma that the turbines actually spin so fast that create this low pressure that causes their lungs to explode and um, we followed a turbine project right next to great basin national park called spring valley wind um, we tried and tried and tried along with several other groups to say, don't put it there because it's within three miles of the Rose Guano Cave, which is a roosting colony for close to 10 million Mexican free tail bat. But they still went ahead and they built this thing within three miles. A few years back, they were violating the numbers that they were permitted to 
kill. So they put in some mitigation measure, measures that they say are working, but they're not really even required to report those numbers anymore. So we don't even know what's happening. Another real big impact of wind turbines is you can see them from everywhere. Um, and there's kind of an emotional um, element to the, the either the rural residents or the, the person who goes and visits who wants to get away from industrialization and urbanization. And when you're looking for miles and miles and you just can't get that view out of your way, um, a lot of local communities and, and um, nature enthusiasts just don't want to see that. Um, the visual impacts are not unlike those of those big power towers we were just talking about. They're just um, extensive and they go on for miles and miles. So um, the other thing, Laura mentioned how they have to put these on ridges and mountains and they generally, to put a turbine that big, we're talking almost 600 feet tall on top of some ridge, you have to level off the top of the mountain. It's not quite mountaintop removal for a coal mine, but you know, it is mountaintop removal. They're really creating a pretty big industrial impact there. And I remember from a previous conversation that not all of the wind projects that they've cited have been cited well for wind. Some of them have been cited well for power transmission reasons. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think in California, there's only, you know, four or five really good windy areas that have just the right amount of wind. And they're usually in these passes in the mountains where ocean winds blow westward. So San Gorgonio Pass near Palm Springs, Tehachapi Pass that we were just talking about. Um, in the Bay Area, Altamont Pass and Carquina Strait. And then the other areas, interestingly, don't have very good wind quality, as they say. It doesn't blow um, enough to turn these turbines regularly or they're just sort of breezy and not strong winds so we've noticed a lot of wind projects are underperforming like at Ocotillo wind project down or right next to Anza Borrego Desert State Park we have um, observers there who are residents that are constantly saying well look they're not blowing again today but I mean it's sort of a joke to them they oppose these projects but if you actually get the, the data there are a lot of wind projects that were built in areas including that spring valley nevada that do not produce much power because they're just sited next to a transmission line or easy access to a substation i want to talk to the california public utilities commission about this subject not just about poorly sited turbines but about how some solar projects are um, being so overbuilt, they're overflowing the California grid. I talked to three different people, and I got the same answer from each one of them. They said, as the California Public Utilities Commission, it's our job just to permit these, not to think about that stuff. They said, you need to go to the California Energy Commission and talk to them about it. But the the point being is that the the actual fact, are so buried in, in the bureaucracy of all of these agencies that the people running the show don't even think about it. Wow, so the decision makers are not well informed. Yeah, it's like we keep hearing with the Bureau of Land Management when a solar project is, or even a wind project is not cited well, I mean, or cited horribly, like this Gemini solar project on really high quality desert tortoise habitat, which probably has more tortoises than some critical habitat units, just because it's hasn't been disturbed yet. And the BLM will say, well, all we do is respond to the developer, the applicant. That's all we do. Instead of saying, well, no, this is, you've got to respond to that. This is public land and it should be managed well and um, maybe say no to some projects that are cited poorly. When it comes to the federal government, they have to evaluate the purpose and the need of the project. And we constantly tell them when, when these are poorly cited, which is most of the time, where is the need? And we never get an answer. 
Right. They've previously had to also uh, when when the when the projects are on public lands, the government has been required to do some kind of environmental review. Yes, they are required to do um, a NEPA review, which stands for National Environmental Policy Act, which is sort of a bedrock law that says, well, if you're going to develop something that has significant impacts to a whole list of things like visual resources, rare species, threatened and endangered species, or even next to a community um, that will impact a human community, you have to do an environmental impact statement and it has to have public input and you have to analyze a range of alternatives like a they have to do like a no action alternative which means say no to the project which we've almost seen them never do in, in 10 years so the trouble with this is um under the last several presidents i mean it's definitely getting worse under trump is that this is becoming streamlined more and more. And they're they're not getting rid of the law, NEPA, but they're streamlining it. They're finding these little shortcuts like, um, oh, you can only write your environmental impact statement in a year and it can't be over 150 pages, which is actually kind of stupid because that opens it up to lawsuits more. But then our problem is we can never find enough lawyers to sue on these projects because they're green energy, quote unquote. Right. So this is one of the issues that you've faced as activists trying to help preserve or protect these desert landscapes and wildlife habitat is that there's people who seem like they would be your natural allies, but they don't want to team up on these particular issues. Yeah, this is a big problem. I mean, Kevin and I both have a lot to say about this because if the Gemini area, it's, on, it's called California Wash in Clark County, Nevada. It's right next to the Muddy Mountains Wilderness. If this were an oil and gas exploration, all the environmental groups would be dogpiling on it. Sierra Club, National Resources Defense Council, everybody. But because it's a renewable energy project, we can't get anyone to touch it. Nobody's helping. And so we have to bring up the issue of climate change here because um, it's very important. And it's really the reason that the developers are using to justify putting the gigantic project out there in the desert. Gemini Solar will require hundreds of scraper grader vehicles. These are not running on electricity. These are fossil fuel Gemini Solar will take out biological soil crust, will take out a lot of plants, will destroy caliche layers. All of this sequesters CO2. Um, really, what's going on here? Are the developers and the politicians worried about climate change? Or are they just cashing in on climate change? And to me, that's really kind of a bitter pill to swallow because... All of us are worried about climate change, but I think we're creating a situation of tangled transmission grids, remote solar and wind projects that have to be maintained by fossil fuel bearing vehicles. Is this really the best way to deal with climate change? Right, and part of the reason that these projects are happening in this way, on this scale, uh, by these corporations is because this is policy, right? Because this is what the federal government has been encouraging through a variety of means. The federal government, as well as the states, um, so California passed a renewable portfolio standard. It's got a lot of like disclaimers in it in fine print, but it, it essentially requires. Um, that utilities receive 100% of their energy from renewable sources. I think it's 2030 in California. Yeah. So in Nevada, they did um, a similar one, only at 50%. But that's required by um, to get 50% from, from renewable sources by 2030 as well. And so there's a real political push to get all of this stuff built. 
to put it on the list that kind of a bean counter thing and they say yeah we built all of these and the question is are they working but it's a political mandate um, you have to do it by a certain time and a lot of the reasons they pick public land is because they're just out there and available they don't have to get all of these private land permits and negotiate with landowners and that sort of thing so the politics are really pushing this to the point where the BLM is saying, look, we're going to have to even override our own laws in order to get this stuff approved. So so the states and some government entities are requiring more use. Well, I guess it sounds like the states are requiring more use of what they're calling renewable energy. And then besides that, there is also subsidies, aren't there, that are helping to make this more profitable for the companies that are building these uh, these plants? Yes, under Obama, um, they gave out huge grants from the Treasury, just money outright. Here, take $300 million to build your large project. And then Department of Energy loan guarantees, which was basically, you know, don't worry if you go bankrupt, we'll cover you. And Trump, um, those were discontinued, but Trump has definitely been kind of an all of the above energy president. He hasn't um, said he hates, he's, he'll say he hates wind, but he doesn't because he has investment tax credits from the IRS, um, production tax credits that definitely are kind of crucial for some of these projects to make enough profit to be built. So they definitely get a handout from the government. And President Trump made that classic, pretty dumb comment about how wind turbines cause cancer. And so the public perceived him as the enemy of wind. However, consider that the American Wind Energy Association came out with a news release about a month and a half ago praising President Trump for rolling back all of the regulations of the National Environmental Policy Act. So I think it's a real big myth that Trump is against renewable energy. What he's against is regulation and that's really benefiting the developers. The price of photovoltaics has gone down so much that many of these companies don't even need a subsidy to build it. Right, because they needed a subsidy before just for the enormous cost of building projects this large. But now that the cost of some of the components are coming down, it's, it's cheaper for them. Right. And I, I wanted to say one more thing about policy is that in Nevada, Kevin and I were horrified to learn that the recent 50% renewable portfolio standard decided to take out energy efficiency. So before that, and this is the Nevada state legislature and the Democrats, they, they would include energy efficiency towards counting towards this RPS, which makes abundant sense. I mean, if we're going to have all these solar and wind projects, let's make our homes and businesses maximum energy efficient so we don't just waste energy when it, you know, heats our homes. And We think there's absolutely no way to go 100% renewable without energy efficiency. It's just common sense. Right. And California is a little better because they at least passed this... Um, you know, million solar rooftops initiative. And then in a, a year or two, I think all new homes in California will be required to have rooftop solar. And we think that's the way to go. That's what we have to do. Don't dig up desert tortoise habitat, put it on the rooftops in urban areas. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... So this, this brings us around to what you're seeing as, as better solutions to the climate change problem and, and to the issues, just the general issues of, of degrading the earth, uh, is that there's other things we can do besides these large solar and wind farms in the, in the desert. And that would include 
greater efficiency, so insulating houses better, new windows, etc., and local uh, local solar. Is can you say more about about these uh, local solutions? Yeah, we sort of have a, a loading order to what's best, and energy efficiency energy efficiency should be number one priority for any incentives and policies nationwide and by states. Um, and then after that, uh, distributed energy resources like rooftop solar paired with battery storage, because that's a big problem right now. We have plenty of big solar projects out there, but they produce too much energy during the peak middle of the day when the sun is shining. And this isn't talked about enough, but in California, the California Independent System Operator, which controls the grid, sees that the grid is overloaded from all these solar projects and tells the developers and owners of the projects, well, you got to shut that down, shut your project off. It's called curtailment. You can actually Google curtailment in Cal ISO and see that every month, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, and it's getting worse. Thousands of megawatt hours, I think hundreds of thousands of megawatt hours are being shut off during the middle of the day because there's too much and not enough storage. So if we did in urban areas had even things like solar gardens where, say, um, an empty lot were made into a very small solar project with storage and that could serve underprivileged communities or apartment buildings and then give incentives to um, rooftop solar owners where they could get a little return on their investment, just like the big solar projects do in the utilities. Um, this isn't perfectly worked out because, I mean, the lithium ion batteries are what's being used now. And there's we're seeing more issues of local desert lithium mining. So, I mean, again, this is it's just going to be a, a very difficult push to go 100 percent renewable energy. I think it's going to take a lot of thought, but I think we can definitely start to make our urban areas produce truly green energy instead of on these desert ecosystems. And just to say, a, a friend of mine has a lives off the grid. He has a home surrounded by the Mojave National Preserve, and he has a freezer that he has had ice that he hasn't defrosted for two years and he runs that freezer on just a 12 volt battery. And he does that by um, rearranging the heating coils and making the device extremely efficient. And the, the point is, is if he can do that, so can these big giant appliance makers and electric companies, they just don't want to. And so we need to start cutting the bullshit and to start talking about what we can actually do, what we can save, and not trying to maintain a level of waste by using tens of square miles of habitat and destroying that. Um, we, we can do a lot better, but if we're not going to have that conversation, 100% renewable is an illusion. It's unfortunate, but there are ways to do it. Right. So efficiency is really a huge deal here, like uh, not only insulating a house, having double pane windows, et cetera, like that, but all the appliances that are being used in a household or a business, I suppose. Yeah. And there's I mean, you can go even more advanced and build what's called a net positive energy building or home where you have an amount of storage like a, you know, a power wall or a lot of companies are making these battery storage units that you produce so much um, energy with your rooftop solar system that you have more than you can use. You store it at night. You can plug plug in your electric car, store it there. But a net positive energy building would be able to export that locally produced solar energy to the, a grid or even like a microgrid that's managed by a town. You don't have to connect to PG&E. I and mean, I think the future is we don't want PG&E anymore, that type of giant, you know, profit-making utility that doesn't care about us. We could have microgrids attached to everybody's rooftop solar system. And then when there's, you know, too much solar during the day, you store it in your electric car or your battery. 
And if you have, you know, say there is a blackout, well, then you can mobilize those stored energy battery systems into a microgrid and everyone um, floats through this, the, you know, the planned safety power shutoffs that are happening now from PG&E. I was just going to say, also consider how many people have lost their lives over wildfires created by remote transmission, many of which carry green electrons over mountains. And those mountains are getting drier. Um, we're going to have more wildfires. And this is just not the way to go anymore. Well, this brings up a really interesting trend that is not being talked about in the media, and I wish it were more, but pg e is the perfect example of probably what the future is going to hold, and that pg e itself is making microgrids in the Sierra foothills and parts of Northern California to kind of island them from the greater grid system so that if there is fire weather and a, a power shutoff, these microgrids will keep going because they've got um, their own local resources. And I think it, this is just in the beginning because unfortunately diesel generators are sometimes the backup for these microgrids. But I think in the future it can be more and more local rooftop solar, little solar gardens and forms of energy storage. I mean, I can see it coming though. I mean, pg e that central station, hundreds of miles of 500 kilovolt giant transmission lines going over wild mountain landscapes to a city. That's just not going to work, especially in California with the fire hazards. So I think there's a new model coming. Oh, I certainly hope so. Uh, this was an issue we didn't talk about earlier, which I meant to bring up was the whole topic of delivery of the power transmission lines and how you set up these large projects far away from urban centers and now you need to bring the energy there and there's different issues with that including loss of energy along the way right these high voltage transmission lines have a number of issues i mean number one guess who pays for them the rate payers i mean that's by law that a utility can get all of its um construction costs back by charging the rate payers for transmission lines so it's actually in the interest of utilities to keep building more of these things. Number two, they're a fire hazard when they cross over forested mountains, chaparral mountains. Number three, they provide um, nesting surfaces for ravens across the desert where otherwise ravens wouldn't nest. And these ravens then go pick off desert tortoises like crazy. And sage grouse. It's a problem for sage grouse too. Number four, again, they're like carving up landscapes with new roads and visual eyesores and microgrids in a local community would be an alternative. Um, as far as energy loss goes, um, you know that the power companies and the developers want to build more transmission lines, but it's much harder to build a transmission line than it is to build a solar project because they're long. And even on public lands, they have to go through a lot of different um, differently managed areas, but sometimes it's over private land. It can take years and years. And so the developers end up really going after the areas where the transmission lines already are. And those transmission lines are all old. And the, the, older, the older they are, the more energy they lose. And so when you get that huge grid down by the I-15 in Nevada or the I-10 in California, um, there are some upgrades, but they're basically using an old dinosaur system, and that's losing a lot of energy. Well, and I add one more thing to add on this, too, is that, I mean, the whole issue of energy storage for renewable energy, it needs to be what they call dispatchable, meaning you want to flip a switch and you get that energy, you know, within seconds. You don't want to have to wait. And what they were finding with the Crescent Dunes solar power tower, the solar thermal one that turned a an steam turbine, but it had molten salt storage tanks, enormous. I mean, these were enormous industrial tanks. And the energy was supposed to go to Las Vegas or even Los Angeles, I think. Las Vegas. Las Vegas. But this was, you know, 
hundred miles away, and they found that the molten salt tanks weren't really dispatchable. It took like what? Do you remember, Kevin, the number? Well, I don't remember the number, but they don't serve as base flood. Yeah, they. I don't remember the number, but they don't serve as base flood. Right. It took like minutes to switch your molten salt tank on and feed that heat energy into the steam turbine and then get that electricity 100 miles away to the city. So it wasn't dispatchable. There was too much of a delay because, um, I mean, the dirty secret now is our backup energy is largely peaker gas plants, natural gas plants. And a peaker natural gas plant is basically a jet engine that you switch on and off. You can switch it on and it suddenly fires up and turns that steam turbine and then you can switch it off, no problem. You can't do that with a nuclear power plant and coal burning plants are a little harder to do that. So, I mean, right now, we're at, our civilization in the United States is basically being backed up by peaker natural gas plants. I haven't heard about these really at all. Well, I mean, we're, it's it's sort of the green illusion that we're moving towards solar and wind and i think one of the only ways you can back up and possibly call it renewable is hydro but that has huge impacts to salmon damming rivers and that's what california wants to do is start damming rivers and that there's been a big controversy about well that shouldn't be called renewable <laughs> rightfully so so i think the whole storage problem is is the thing that's going to hang up the green new deal and nobody's talking about it. Right. I mean, damming rivers is certainly not green in, in, in any sense at all, as, I mean, the habitat destruction that takes place behind the dam and below the dam is, is rather significant. Right. So there's even another type of storage problem that Kevin and I are having to be dealing with, which is called pumped hydro storage. And these are, this is supposedly renewable energy. And they want to do these in the desert, which is even more ridiculous. I think there are some in the world that may be working in wetter areas, but you basically build two large reservoirs, one higher and one lower, and you have pipes underground connecting them. And the pipe, water pipe, has a, a turbine. And you use, the theory is you use a excess wind and solar energy to pump the water uphill to the uphill reservoir. And then during the night or when you need it, you let the water run down through this turbine underground to the lower reservoir. So that's the theory, but they want to build, there's like three or four of these that they want to build in the desert with, with groundwater which we don't have enough of. I mean, it's just absolutely the most ridiculous idea to pump groundwater and the evaporation rate will be huge. They want to build one right um, south of Joshua Tree National Park called Eagle Crest Pump Storage. And it's actually, they're using a couple of old mine pits. So they're saying, well, yeah, we're, we're utilizing this, but they have to pump the groundwater and they're going to have to, what they're predicting is that this reservoir will lose 3,000 acre feet a year just simply through evaporation. You know, it's really hot down there. And also seepage, they'll line the bottom of this mine site, but those liners don't last. And so the water seeps through. Um, some of that will go back into the groundwater, but it's so far from where they're pumping it won't go into the same area. So it really is a disaster. Like that particular project you're talking about, that's uh, actually, that's located in a little notch into uh, Joshua Tree National Park, if I recall correctly. Yeah, it was actually part of the park once and they removed it, I guess, because it was an old mine, but it, it's right, like completely like adjacent to it. The park service is opposed to it for another reason is that the, artificial water source will create some subsidies for things like ravens and then that will um, cause a, another you know big threat to the tortoises in the area which are already undergoing a lot of habitat loss over 
large scale solar and um, disease and that sort of thing. Right, and also within Joshua National Tree, Joshua Tree National Park, there's at least a half a dozen California fan palm oases, and they get their water from ancient water that seeps up through fissures in the rock, and they're concerned that the w taking water for this project might dry up those oases. Absolutely. I mean, pumping groundwater in the desert is pumping fossil water that's non-renewable. That's a not renewable um, resource. Yeah, if I remember correctly, there was an environmental review for this that said that the residents around De Desert Center, that's the town right near that area, the residents that have well wells will all see their wells drop something like 10 feet for a year just just from the act of filling this thing up with water right so so all this is begging this issue of 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 storage because you were we, we first you talked about how solar is actually overproducing during certain times of day so they're shutting it down but then we th then nightfall comes and that's when energy is still needed, but obviously solar is not working then. So how is how is energy going to be stored from any of these projects? You talked about molten salt at one, but and now you talked about these uh, reservoirs of different heights, where I guess the higher one going into the lower one would turn a turbine. Uh, but I guess that probably batteries is probably what most people are thinking about. It is, but... I mean, are we really there yet? Because I, I don't have all the numbers off the top of my head, but I know battery storage banks, they're not going to run all night. They're going to run like 40 minutes. And they're they are basically going to be there to even out the grid, not really to solve um, the, the nighttime um, evening problem. So um, energy storage banks. I think we would just need like something like 30 billion gigawatts of battery storage just to run our, our lifestyle here in the in the USA. So we're not there yet. Um, the largest battery storage bank that I know of in the world is a Tesla bank, and it's in Australia, and it's for a wind farm. It's about 100 megawatts, but that doesn't run any cities all night. That just keeps the grid stable. So battery storage is a, is a cyst, but, you know, they're talking about it like it's the big holy grail solution, but they're not even close to being there yet. Right. Besides the issues of the batteries themselves, the substances that need to be mined for those batteries, and then what happens to the batteries when they've reached the end of their life? Yeah, the lithium ion on batteries have some interesting elements it can be recycled but from what i'm researching it's not yet profitable to recycle these batteries so um, we're not seeing a a real big demand for um, uh, solutions to actually dealing with the batteries when when they're they can't be used anymore and then um they're very dangerous um, apparently when they catch fire um, they've been compared to these these trick birthday cake candles that you can't blow out. It's really impossible to extinguish a fire. So they'll have these battery back storage plans on these, these remote sites. But if there's a big fire out there, though, there's probably going to be injuries. There's probably going to be like, workers that are getting hurt. So battery storage really is in an early stage. In all honesty, it does work on the smaller scale. Um, you know, if everybody has a lithium battery in their home, it's still going to create a demand for mining and that sort of thing. And there's a big impact out there. But but it still does work on a small scale. But we are looking at also a land rush of lithium mining out in the desert here. In fact, we just um, found an active mine near Death Valley Junction in California. Um, there's a uh, proposal to mine lithium along the Amargosa River in the California side next to Death Valley National Park. And there are several lithium mines that are proposed or even going up in Nevada. Um, you're familiar with the one with the team, Buckwheat. I know you've written articles about that. Um, but 
you know, there's actually a number of other ones. I'm getting involved in one called Thacker Pass, which is up near Winnemucca, which is going to be 5,000 acres. They're going to need 5,000 acre feet of water a year just to process this. And it's in prime sage grouse and bighorn sheep habitat. So, you know, green lithium mining is anything but as well. Um, but we can recycle it and we're not putting enough money into that. We're just getting all these miners wanting to, you know, go out and do the wild west routine on public lands again. Because lithium mining is uh, super water intensive. As I recall, what happens is that there is lithium found in particular kinds of soils, right? And so they then flood these areas. Well, they, they'll make a brine, right? Where they bring up the, the, the soil with the minerals in it, and then they let that evaporate. So you're bringing water up to the surface in a, in a dry desert area, letting that water evaporate on purpose, and then going through uh, what's left over and uh, refining that into, into lithium. That's true. There's actually two different types of lithium mine. You described that one. Well, those are the brine mines. And um, there's not a dry lake in Nevada where they haven't explored for it. In fact, there's exploration going on right now in Panamint Valley, right next to Death Valley National Park. And it's really controversial. But a lot of the other mines now, including the one that's proposed near the team buckwheat habitat or these hard rock lithium mines where they're just essentially taking the lithium deposits out of the rock and in some cases processing them on the site. I mentioned Thacker Pass. That's what they would be doing. Uh, but it wouldn't be a brine project. And um, it looks like the, the hard rock mines move faster than the brine mine that seems like they're uh, more economic deposits than those. The appetite for lithium also has ramifications uh, for foreign policy in that uh, the recent overthrow of the Morales government in Bolivia was done in part, it was felt, because of the newly discovered lithium deposits there that the socialist president wanted to nationalize, but that private corporations from outside the country, of course, wanted to exploit for their own profit. Yeah, there's definitely a global, you know, uptick in lithium mining and um, environmental groups, I think, are having a hard time trying to figure out how to, you know, is it, should we just get all our lithium from places like Bolivia and China, or should we start digging up our own public lands for lithium? We've seen different environmental groups um, kind of have a hard time figuring out best policy on this one. Um, again, also, there's a, technology is there to recycle. And so there are um, some lithium developers looking at the, the old mine site near Boron, California, which was a borax mine. But um, that same type of material also contains lithium. And apparently it can be recycled. I don't know what the cost is, but um, those are the types of things that I think, well, Democratic candidates should be thinking about subsidizing. If we're going to continue to use lithium, um, let's start looking into the recycling aspect for some of these areas that have already been greatly impacted. <laughs> Right. And that kind of brings us around to the topic of the Green New Deal. And that phrase is thrown around a lot, uh, the idea of a Green New Deal. But there is also legislation that was presented by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And I can't remember the senator who co-sponsored that with her. But I read that legislation when it first came out. And there wasn't really any reassurance in there that building renewable energy projects would take the ecological costs of those projects in mind. Yeah, that's been kind of a worry for us because, I mean, it seems like most of the past Democratic or present Democratic candidates like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, have wanted to spend trillions of dollars on a Green New Deal, but no reassurance that this won't just be on public lands, more giant, large-scale utilities, solar and wind projects on public lands. And 
I mean, our best hope would be, you know, get a good candidate in there, a good Democrat, and then educate them once they're in that, well, no, we have to do rooftop solar and distributed energy. So that has been a bit of a worry that there's a lot of lessons we've learned in the last 10 years of build out. And our candidates are still just saying all of the above, no planning. You know, we'll, we'll just build you know, thousands of more square miles of projects on public lands. So that's, we don't want to hear that, but we want to educate the Democrats better. Yeah, I think there's a lot of education needed all all around on that, not just the Democratic politicians, but the Democratic voters uh, as well, so that they can be selecting better candidates and pushing them to, to make changes too. Right. You know, it's interesting. Um, one of my favorite candidates actually was, Julian Castro, he came out with a Green New Deal that was a conservation plan for public lands. And I really wish that that had caught on fire more. I thought he, he didn't have like a build out plan. He had a conservation of ecosystems, carbon sequestration plan for um, native vegetation, wild land. So there are some better ideas out there. And it's too bad that they weren't um, allowed to move forward more, including by the voters. Right. Yeah, no, I hadn't even heard of that one. That's interesting. So what are the big projects that y'all are working on right now or that are on your radar now that you're trying to get attention to? I know the Gemini uh, project is at the top of that list, and you've mentioned it a few times. Maybe you could just quick give a rundown on the Gemini and then any other of the big projects that you're looking at right now. Well, I'll start with that. Um, Gemini is the 7,100-acre project on tortoise habitat. And one of the reasons we've made a lot of um, comments about this talk to the press is because um, we understand from um, agency officials that solar developers are requesting that they use the new Gemini mitigation method, mowing vegetation, so they can actually develop some um, higher value conservation areas, like areas of critical environmental concern. The, the BLM isn't agreeing to that, but we believe that this project will set precedence. So in Nevada, there, in the Southern Nevada, there are 24 solar applications that are being prioritized by the Bureau of Land Management. So you can say Gemini is just the beginning. Not all of these move, they don't all go anywhere, but it's a pretty big number. And um, one of them um, is on Joshua at the Pahrump Valley, looks to be about 10,000 acres. So we're seeing a, a, another really big land rush. We're following that. Um, Basin and Range Watch is getting more into lithium mining because these are also popping up all over the place. And so we wanna follow a bunch of those as well. Um, we're not a big group, so we can't follow everything, but generally speaking, we'll comment on all of the renewable projects, the large scale ones around the region that we follow. Um, and we do have other issues that we are um, involved in as well. Um, we oppose legislation that's coming up, up that's being trying to be that they're trying to attach to the Defense Act to create lands bills all over Nevada, and these are bills that will give public lands away to private ownership. Um, one in particular down in Clark County would give close to 45,000 acres of tortoise habitat to developers. And I mean, that's really a death knell for the tortoise when you compare that to all the large scale solar that's proposed as well. And there's equally other lands bills in Northern Nevada as well that we are not happy with. Um, the proposed two military expansions have also been something that we've commented on. Um, they want to expand the Fallon Navy base um, to an additional 600,000 acres of public land, actually almost 700,000 acres. And the, um, the Nellis Range, the National Test and Training Range for the Air Force, wants to expand and take about 220,000 acres um, of the Desert National Wildlife Refuge and an additional 80,000 acres of other high-quality public land. Um, other issues we followed, you just wrote about the fuel break 
Um, we got a little bit involved in that one. The, the plan to create fire breaks on 11,000 miles of the Great Basin sounds pretty insane, but that's what they want to do. And we do try to still follow the pinion juniper removal projects that are really proliferating all over the West. So that's kind of a rundown of some of the things that we're, we're doing right now. That's quite a list. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot out there. Yeah, did you did you have anything to add to that list, Laura? There's a, I mean, a bunch of other little projects too. Like, and there's the Camino Solar Project that just came up, which is a tricky one because in the California desert, stakeholders, and by that I mean government agencies and a lot of national environmental groups, put together this desert renewable energy conservation plan, and I cons should be in quotes because what it did is divide up the original um, California desert conservation area into this system of solar energy zones and then some conservation areas and the solar energy zones we commented on this years ago were so hard to figure out their maps were very vague that we're seeing them start to be built on and there were little tiny slivers of zones I didn't even see on the maps during the environmental review. So this Camino Solar Project's um, near Tehachapi Pass in the West Mojave Desert, and it's in the solar energy zone. So it will get a very reduced, streamlined NEPA review. Instead of an environmental impact statement, it will just get a short environmental assessment, which is much shorter, much less public involvement because they said, well, it's a solar energy zone. We already, you know, analyzed it years ago, but it, it's Joshua trees. It's um, desert tortoise. It's kit fox burrowing owls. It's actually a biodiversity hot spot, but it's in a zone. So it's going to be really hard to fight, but there, there's just so many unintended consequences of the past 10 years planning. And we're still seeing the fallout. How is there anything you'd like to add here at the end that we didn't cover today? Yeah, I'd like to say um, young students going into law school, choose environmental law and take a look at issues, not just oil and gas, but just take a look at issues like desert tortoises, um, golden eagles getting um, impacted by wind farms. I mean, we need you. We need more environmental law students going into environmental law that will look at these kinds of issues because we're we're having a hard time stopping these now they're all moving forward without legal action and and i would say tell your representatives we don't want all this on public lands we just don't need to do it we think it's an old model there are better ways and when we lose our public lands, we lose what little open space we have left I also want to say um, I really appreciate folks like you spreading the word around. It's, yeah. it's, it's actually really helpful. Your books are great. Your blog posts, your counterpunch articles, all of that really does make a difference. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It's nice to hear you hear you say so. I, I spent you know a few winters camping down in the Mojave Desert, a lot of that in the Mojave National Preserve. And all I had to do was spend some time there and see the amazing beauty of these places uh, in order to, to feel strongly that they shouldn't be uh, on the chopping block for any reason at all, uh, green or not. Yeah. I mean, once you see it and see the biodiversity and beauty, you're amazed that this could be bulldozed. Yeah, I think that that's a big part of what, what's happening here is that of course, most people in the United States live in cities these days, and they don't really know what's going on in the wilderness. And, you know, maybe people have kind of an idea of like what a forest is, and let's not clear cut forests. But most people don't have much of an understanding of deserts at all. Just think of them as being empty or even dead places and have no idea that they are uh, rich ecosystems that de deserve protection as much as anything else. Yeah, exactly. There's trees too, Joshua trees. Yuccas and huge numbers of rare plants, many undescribed to science. There's lizards, kangaroo rats. I mean, I could just go on all day about the uh, biodiversity. Yeah, the white tailed antelope ground squirrels are one of my particular favorites. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> just, just for being so cute. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Well, we, we could certainly talk more, uh, but we've gone a little bit over an hour. I feel like that's good for an episode. So maybe you could just let us know how listeners can find out more about what you're doing. Where can they find you online? Yeah, well, great. Thank you. And um, yeah, Basin Range Watch, you can find us on our website, basinandrangewatch.org. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter and sometimes on Instagram. So follow us and we're always looking for um, people to help out and volunteer and you can donate too. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate talking to you today. Thank you. Thanks. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri. K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.